Hello. We'll talk about implant prosthetic steps in an easy and enjoyable way and solve side effects in this prosthodontics on Friday. I am Jo Inho, the MC of the program. From today, we are going to deal with the top five hot issues in a series in this prosthodontics on Friday. The first speaker is Professor Lim Young-jun, prosthodontic department of Seoul National University Hospital. Hello. Today you have prepared the first topic of the implant heart issues. Would you briefly introduce that? I am the first speaker, a little bit excited. I'm going to talk about the posterior implant occlusal plane and embracer space design. Posterior implant design is something we have to deal with daily and we also need to consider many things to that. That's why I came up with the subject. The design would determine the endurability or the longevity of the implant. That's why I chose that topic. I look forward to your lecture. If you are watching on the demo site, you can ask questions using the chatting window on the right marking the first anniversary of opening of Deno. If you participate in the discussion in the chatting, you may receive a coffee coupon. The questions you post will be answered during Q&A. Now, let's get started with the first lecture of the Hot Issue series with Professor Im Young-jun. Let me get started with the story of the posterior implant occlusal plane and embracer space design. This is the contents. Occlusal plane for posterior implant designing of the plane. These two need to be considered. First, occlusal table itself should be narrow. According to the paper, steep cusp and narrow occlusal surface is favorable to receive less occlusal force. This is well known. Because of this, we try to make the occlusal table small. How small? Usually it says buccolingually one-fourth or one-third should be reduced and the mesodistally it should be as narrow as possible. So, implant prosthesis is made in small size. As you know, the width of the occlusal table is directly related to the width of the implant that is placed, limited to the posterior region. The implant diameter should be at least 5 millimeters these days. 6 millimeters is also available, then we can make appropriate emergence profile. And the mesodistal width would be appropriate even though the occlusal table is reduced in size. Immediate implant is the hot topic these days. Wide implant needs to be placed in the posterior region as long as the bone width is enough. It will bring a lot of benefits, especially the short implants can be used in the mandible to avoid the inferior alveolar nerve. Compared to the regular body, the surface area is 1.6 times larger and it can be placed deeper. As it's thicker, the surface area is similar to a natural tooth, very favorable to the occlusion. The second thing which is well known is to avoid the adverse effects, the cusp inclination should be minimized. 
complaints complain like this discomfort not feeling right which is related to the passive fit and um, food impaction that's frequent complaint and uh, some patients come back on the next day complaining pain in the lower teeth I explained to the patient that the space used to be edentulous, missing teeth, so for a long time it was not in the function, therefore the area is constricted. Now it's suddenly in the function and the patient may experience pain for some time. Regarding occlusion, the prosthesis seems low and um, the patient cannot chew, properly chew. And we need to think about if we provided a prosthesis low and occlusion table, is it too small? And sometimes we argue with the patient because we say that's what it's supposed to be. The loss of posterior teeth creates a lot of problems. We already know the shifting of remaining teeth and there is a lack of height these are known already but my point is with the loss of posterior teeth the masculatory muscle disuse atrophy occurs making the cheeks slim those with squared jaws receive Botox injection in the masculatory muscle to look slim here. For example, if there is mandibular fracture, if you have intermaxillary fixation for a long time, if it is not used, the cheeks would be sunk. The importance of providing posterior implant occlusion, the important thing is to establish a stable centric occlusion. It is very important for these three factors. Posterior can play the role of a vertical step and it provides stability and it is important for posturing. This patient is shaking her mandible continuously, a senior lady. I think she is a complete denture patient. She has been with the edentulous jaws for a long time. That's why that is happening. Stability, a denture without stability cannot be used. In the fixed prosthesis, the role of the prosthesis in the posterior region is to provide stability, to maintain comfortable postures, and to maintain interjaw relations. But if a vertical stop has been lacking for a long time and uh, interjaw occlusion is not stable and the stable postures cannot be maintained in a patient, then obtaining the stable centric position is very challenging when creating implant prosthesis occlusion, especially when implants are mixed with natural teeth. The reason is well known. It is based on the difference between the implant and a natural tooth, that is the existence or lack of PDL. In the PDL, as we know, there is the mechanoreceptors in the implant. There is nothing that can absorb shocks and there is no tissues that can control nerves, so all the force is transmitted to bone. Tactile perception in the mouth, if something tiny comes in, it is the perception to detect it. It is determined by the mechanoreceptors in the skin, mucosa, and tongue to perceive something is there. For a complete denture, CRCO, CRMIP, we need to align the CO. That's because there is a no PDL in the edentulous patient. In such patients, guiding the mandible from CR to MIP is not an easy task. And the role of the mechanoreceptors 
is the defense mechanism to control the occlusal force at each cycle. So, lack of PDL is the biggest difference between implant and uh, natural tooth, also in terms of function. Implant occlusion has been studied by many scholars for a long time, and uh, all these factors that need to be considered. The occlusion of an implant is biomechanically related. Mish also talked about implant protected occlusion. Therapeutic occlusion concept was explained by Weinberg and basic principles of implant occlusion. All of these have been written in papers. May I cut in and ask a question? Of course, Professor Cho, many clinical researchers say compared to a natural tooth to prevent, protect implant, vertical and uh, lateral force need to be reduced. In order to do so, how do you implement that in a clinical setting? I think the most important thing is stable occlusion formation on MIP is very important. Secondly, widening centric. Number three, anterior guide as much as possible. Those are three principles need to be implemented. In terms of the occlusal force, is it the same on the implant and natural tooth? I will talk about that in my lecture. Okay, please go back to your lecture. Things to consider for posterior implant occlusal plane. This seems off topic, but I need to talk about implant positioning. In the posterior, the ideal implant position would lead to the ideal occlusal plane and embracer space design, but it's not that easy to do that. Surgery cannot be done ideally. If the oral environment is very good, the teeth would not go missing, bone is resorbed and uh, the teeth positions are not very good, uh, so implants cannot be placed in an ideal positions. Ideally, in the posterior region, the ideal implant position is in line with the central fossa of the adjacent teeth. That is the best position. So implant position uh, can explain almost all. 30 to 40% reduction in the occlusal plane is recommended. If we are to do the reduction on the maxilla, palatal, in the mandible, buccal reduction would be recommended because in most cases when bone is resorbed on the maxilla, the arch size is reduced and implants tends to be placed inwardly and therefore we need to place it a little bit outwardly for better interjaw relations and the opposite is true for the mandible. So palatal reduction on the maxilla and the buccal reduction in the mandible is recommended. Cusp inclination needs to be reduced. If the patient is comfortable after the delivery of the prosthesis, we need to think about whether the cusp height is appropriate or it is delivered as monoplane. The concept of the occlusion is very well known, but it is difficult to um, do it that way, and surgery is also not an easy thing to do. Um, for the implant placement, we need to communicate with the patient for satisfactory occlusion. This is my favorite concept, the wide freedom in centric occlusion. 
conclusion. This is from an old article. Cars collide with each other on the V form. Freedom of centric. If it is 1.5 millimeters, uh, the space is important. Weinberg also talked about this, which is already known to many. To give freedom to the centric, many people are making efforts. Implant prosthesis, there is no mechanical receptors. So a guide from CR to MIP is lacking. Therefore, widening centric is required. Regarding the occlusion, I began to do the insurance implant. It is very difficult to control the metal. Um, occlusal registration is very important to reduce the chair time, a lab process, impression taking should be made very accurately to live long for me. Which bar do I use? For porcelain, I use the spun burr for the grinding. Slide in centric, freedom in centric is important. This is posterior implant crown, the ideal contact. Everything else aside, the primary occlusal contact should be on the central fossa. Secondary occlusal contact should not be greater than one millimeter from the central fossa, as it is recommended. This is not easy. The marginal reach, the functional cusp, maxillary functional cusp, it should be ground a little bit. Regarding the cantilever, it also discussed, except the bilateral balanced occlusion. Regarding the non-working interference, the contact should not be made. This is something we discussed before. This is a famous article. Jacobson and Atoll published the article in 1991. In English, it is termed as the timed occlusal contacts. In other words, occlusal awareness, recognizing the occlusal force within the mouth, natural tooth to natural tooth, 20 micron. The number is not very important. Very thin things can be recognized. Natural tooth to implant, implants on both jaws. There is a wide variety of the level of perception, depending on those. As we know, the natural teeth are mobile, so we do the ortho treatment. Implant moves, however, it has very small lateral or axial movements, timed occlusal movements, is composed of occlusal awareness and implant crown mobility. It reminds me of the tray karaoke, which was a popular program in the past. All natural teeth are trying to avoid the falling tray by lowering the head. However, the implant is just sitting straight and uh, gets hit hard by the falling tray. So when the patient complains of discomfort, there's uh, no problem when you see the occlusal marks, but the dentist should think there is a little mobility of the implant prosthesis under bite and um, implant prosthesis has a lot of contact when biting and premature contact is a lot that needs to be adjusted. Timed occlusal contact means, as we know, under light contact, shim stock should be 
able to be removed under hard bite. It says hard biting equilibrium. Under heavy bite, you should not be able to remove the shim stock. We tend to focus on the axial movement, but that causes contact problem slowly. So it is not easy to resolve it with the point of a contact. What I'm trying to say is that the principle and concept need to be understood and that will help when you try to figure out some problems. Cantilever is understood as something not to be done as much as possible. We are focused on the mesial or distal cantilever and some consider buccolingual one as not a cantilever. We need to consider all directions for the cantilever. Increasing proximal contact area for additional stability. This is very important. The most challenging part for me is when I have to make a contact between implant prosthesis in the mouth. If a natural tooth is an adjacent tooth, the patient may complain stiffness. However, I can manage that. But this is related to the paper that I'm going to introduce later. Not point of contact, but surface contact needs to be provided. That's what I'm thinking. To get the surface contact in a single implant, it is very important to whether the screw is loosened or not. If the top of the implant is hit by the occlusal force, the implant would spin or turn, but that can be stopped by the contact of an adjacent tooth. So providing the guiding plane or the surface contact is very important. We need to actively utilize a natural tooth. There are four canines and uh, I heard from my father that um, people carry the canines to their grave and that is no longer true as a dentist grind the canines to deliver prosthesis. For the canine guidance, as we have canines left with the prosthesis or not, when we do the implant treatment, we need to utilize uh, the natural teeth and tactile function from the canine should be utilized. If canine is lost and an implant is placed, of course, uh, we need to use the group function. Professor, I wanted to ask a question. When I adjust occlusion, I use one sheet of articulation paper over a natural tooth and two of them over an implant, which should receive lighter occlusal force. Is that the right approach? I do the final checking with the shim stock. For sake of light contact on the implant, I use two sheets of articulation paper. What do you think about that? I learned from you. I think that's a very good idea. Axial mobility differs between them. So I thought about the compensation. Do you think that that's a good idea? Yes, um, I'll do that myself. One more thing. Regarding the embracer space, designing of it is not easy and there is a difference between anterior and posterior regions. Aesthetics sometimes do not go hand in hand with the function, which should be considered more important in terms of the embracer space. This is very challenging. I'm a prosthodontist who considers function very important Embracer clasp should be made big for easy cleaning and for the use of interdental brush. 
Do we need to focus on the function or aesthetics in creating the embracer space? And also, it depends on what the patient wants. Yes, do we need to consider what the patient wants for aesthetics? Sure. If there is a good space, there's no problem. But if the space is tight between the arches, if the implant is placed rather high, the crown needs to be big. And if there is a cantilever, embracer space often create iatrogenic problems. Let me briefly touch upon embracer space before I talk about it. If implant is appropriately placed with appropriate thickness and in the right position, the design of embracer or occlusion can go pretty easily, but it's easier said than done. The embracer space is influenced by the implant abutment and how you design the bottom part of a crown. Implants are placed in a severely resorbed bone, so if a short implant is placed, crown implant ratio is very big, so the embracer compared to the natural tooth tends to get bigger. In the case of premolar, when you place a regular implant, the diameter is similar. However, in the molar area, the embracer space needs to be higher and bigger. That's more favorable. Regarding the embracer, when the emergence angle is more than 30 degrees, it's like a cantilever. And if it is convex, not concave, like picture C, they create perimplantitis, according to many papers. Depending on the type of an implant, things can be different. In the molar area, in the posterior region, in terms of trauma and company, tissue level implant is very good. It is higher, so it can compensate for the resorbed bone. And the width is designed to prevent the fracture. And the cervical connection is wide, so in the posterior region, it is ideal in terms of the emergence profile and the function. It is equivalent to the SS type of ostom. Ideal implant placement positions, emergence angle should be more than 30 degrees. Regarding the implant placement, they can be tilted on both sides, so at least there should be 30 degrees for emergence profile. That needs to be remembered. Using the custom abutment, it can be raised. So custom abutment would be better than the stuck abutment. Let me move fast. This case was done together with uh, Professor Yi jong won a periodontist. The implants are too close with each other. It's very difficult for prosthesis and impression taking. That's not very good. And we try to do something about it. In this situation, screws are exposed. And um, I expected a good grafting by the periodontist, but um, embracer is the problem. Therefore, there was no improvement. Removing an implant in the mandible would be difficult, but what if there is a no middle one? It might have been better. So number 37, the middle one is removed and now it is maintained pretty well. So I don't know what is important. 
Some people with a small embracer space, no problem occurs. And um, if the patient has very good oral hygiene, many times there is no problem. And the distance between the implants is very important. I have a lot to talk about this four unit implant. I wonder why there is no implant placed at number five in the picture, the most mesial implant. If that one is good, the middle one could have been removed. Uh, this is an economical problem as well, so the patient wanted to keep it. Embracer clasp. The implants are very close with each other. If the middle one is not restored, it could have been better. So things didn't improve. So at 19 months, we decided to remove. After we place implants, sometimes we are too scared to remove the implant placed. So let me briefly touch upon two journals. One of them is this. There is a lot to talk about this, but let me just briefly touch upon it. Open contacts, when it happens to Westerners, is it a problem? We get the written consent form after immediate denture, and the paper says the ICF needs to be signed by the patient for this, and it talks about the retrievability of implant restorations. I believe this is also a problem in the Western world. Let me introduce an episode. I wrote a paper regarding the prosthesis and sent to a journal in the Western country, and the reviewer said uh, it is not a problem when it comes to an implant. So I th was baffled. I thought that this is uh, the problem confined to Koreans, mesial drifting leading to food impaction. So we are gathering a lot of data in this area. Maybe the reviewer doesn't have a lot of experience with implants. So I was really baffled, and I sent the article to another journal, and it was published. Regarding the open context, the guideline is summarized here. If you read it, it talks about the retrievability of implant as well. Eight items in the guideline, which is pretty interesting. One of them is before impression procedures, guiding plan should be provided. And another thing, if there is an open contact with no food impaction, provide no treatment and monitor patient compliance. These eight items would be very helpful for you. The eight items in the guideline and the paper you mentioned, getting the ICF from the patient after explaining about the open contact that will happen over time, that was um, pretty shocking in an amazing way. I've never obtained ICF signature from a patient, I will follow that. And uh, if we explain it in advance and uh, later if it happens, the patient would think, oh, this doctor can predict what will happen in the future. Otherwise, uh, we will be criticized. So explaining it in advance is very important. Open contact, retrievability is 
available to resolve the open by the problem and these days the young generation dentists prefer cement type over screw type in that case regarding the open contact what advice would you like to give Dentists say, if problem occurs, we do it again. That's right. Everyone seems to be forgiving once an implant is placed. After implant is placed after surgery, if it fails shortly after the implant placement, then it is a big deal for everybody and the failure of prosthesis is forgiven you mean by the dentist by both patients and dentists as you know sometimes we need to retrieve the implants and the fracture and the food infection can occur and uh, we need to clean them so, as a prosthodontist, I prefer the screw type because of the maintenance. I can be considered by young dentists as a member of an older generation. Except special cases, I prefer screw type when a side effect occurs. We need to retrieve that, so I use a screw type, but I'm amazed by the young dentists who use a cement type. There are merits and demerits, but in terms of maintenance, a screw type needs to be preferred. What do you think? I absolutely agree with you. In a single case, Permanent cementation is done, and I also use SCRP as a principle. In a multiple case, it depends on a case. If there is no problem with the maintenance, implant cement is used without using a screw, and um, that should be given thought. Thank you. Would you continue your lecture? This is the last part. This is uh, my favorite paper. A hundred people. Occlusal adjustment is required or necessary. That is the point. One, three, six month follow up. What do you check? Are you okay? You ask the question to a patient, and if there's no problem, we send the patient at home after doing some cleaning. This is a study using T-scan. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18 months. You can see the decrease of the prosthesis adjustment. At recall, we have to do occlusal adjustment. Even though the implanted situation remains the same, the structure can be changed in the mouth due to the natural teeth change. Until the occlusion is stabilized, the occlusal adjustment should be done. So after a year and a half, the adjustments can be reduced for all preventive actions. Periodic occlusal adjustment and recalls are very important. Checking it again and again to prevent problems. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. We received questions in real time, and let's address problems sent by our audience. Many questions in the chatting window. 
Congratulations on the first anniversary of Dan All. So many congratulatory messages, and I would like to thank the audience who sent us the message. Coffee coupon is really powerful. Can you select the questions only? Okay. We have questions. DR2875 sent us a question. The question is, in a multiple implant restoration case in the posterior region, splinting needs to be considered. What's your idea on that? That's a very good question. Splinting, for example, to prevent the prosthetic complications, splinting should be done to prevent biological complications. They should not be splinted. So that's the grand principle. Depending on the implant situation and oral environment, the dentist should make the decision. For example, if the bone is poor on the maxilla, splinting is the way to go. Depending on the situation, you need to use splinting or non-splitting. It's not that one is superior over the other. In the posterior region, if there's no problem in terms of aesthetics and biology, you need to splint them to distribute the stress over the framework. In principle, you need to splint two or more. If it is three or four, you can go like a two plus one or two plus two. Is that for sake of passive fit? Yes. So that is the approach. It's easier to manage the situation than splinting them all together. You talked about the advantages of placing short and thick implants. Is there any disadvantages or anything to note? In the past, placing a short implant was conceived to be problematic because of the crown root ratio. According to recent data, there's uh, not much difference. Yes, it has been improved quite a lot. The ideal implants would be short and thin implants, as long as uh, it facilitates OC integration and has functionally good. Anybody can place them and uh, we can avoid uh, the critical structures. The disadvantages or things to note, for longevity of the occlusal surface, we need to adhere to the principles of occlusion. Screw loosening problems have been resolved almost all. The screw loosening occurs much less compared to the past, that's right. Would you bring up questions, please? There are so many congratulatory messages. Thank you very much for your lecture. So, so many people are watching. Due to constraint of time, we will entertain just one more question. For the posterior implant prosthesis, after splinting, passive fit and settling effect would influence the implant fixture causing bone loss. How do we respond to that? Passive fit of implant prosthesis is a homework for us forever. It is impossible to achieve passive fit from the screw type if they align that is not good enough. That they are in tension pulling from each other. Cement type can be the answer. 
settling effect is well known, especially in the posterior, when the occlusal force is 700 newton centimeters, that occurs. Uh, we wrote a paper on that too, to resolve two problems in the posterior region. Those two problems, I take impressions twice, fixture level impression, before mounting a temporary abutment level impression is taken, prosthesis is made and it is cemented, that is effective to achieve passive fit. Last question by Day Bai. Can we cover the question? Yes. Between anterior and posterior region, which part is more important when it comes to the prosthetic design? It is a difficult question. Anterior region is important for aesthetics, and the posterior region, we need to uh, design properly the appearance also for function. I believe both of them are important in the design. I believe day by is uh, thinking hard about the prosthetics, and uh, I believe he or she can do good design. As long as you think about it hard, you can create good output. We make the prosthesis, but it is used by the patient. Looking at the question, I can see the dentist can make a pretty good prosthesis. Anterior region is important, and also posterior region is important. And we cannot help but to give a very ambiguous answer, unfortunately. That has been a good discussion. Lastly, would you have um, advice to the junior dentists who study hard? Not really an advice. What I want to say is, in placing an implant, be it a dentist or a patient, as I said before, we pay attention to the early implant failures after placing an implant, but we tend to overlook the late implant failures in many cases. When a patient complains, there must be some reasons, and uh, unknowingly, unintentionally, we cause iatrogenic problems causing problems in patients' prognosis. A good doctor should be able to include the prognosis in the treatment, treatment plan, and we need to explain that to the patient, what will happen, and then we need to try to prevent such eventualities. Under COVID-19, we are struggling, and I want to say to the dentists, I hope you don't have any patients who give you a lot of trouble during this year. That's something we always need to deal with that as a fate, as a dentist. Sometimes we have to go with the very complicated patients. I hope you have a good year without patients who are complaining. A lot. Thank you very much for the good words. We talked about the designing posterior implant occlusal surface and embracer space. I hope um, this lecture has been very helpful to many dentists. Thank you very much. This is time to close uh, the program. Uh, prosthodontics on Friday. Those who ask the question and not answered, we will provide the answers online. In the next prosthetics on Friday, we are going to talk about the multi-implant restoration, considerations for selecting abutments and the prosthesis, uh, which will be delivered by Dr. No Guante, Dental School, Gyeonghee University. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much. <laughs>